title of my sermon today is the great I am part six I am the resurrection and the life this last week I watched this movie called the Dropbox the Dropbox was about this pastor named uh, Lee Jong Krak he's from South Korea and what he decided to do because of a heart that he had towards orphan children was put a drop box in the side of his church where people can literally drop off their infant babies and I know that's like unbelievable in our minds but it's something that's a huge problem, especially in, in Asian-like countries. But even in our own country, something I was thinking about was when we were in San Diego, there was a fire station, and on those fire stations, there's little pictures that are pretty much saying that this is a safe, like, uh, I guess, a drop-off location for someone who wants to abandon their children. Uh, there are 400 million children living as orphans in this world today. I mean, as in children, okay, let me back up, living as orphans on the streets. I mean, not just orphans. These are children that have no parents that live on the streets. 400 million people. Unbelievable. For, exactly. Well, exactly. That's heartbreaking when you think about it. I mean, when you really realize it. And, and just, this is on Netflix. So if you have Netflix, you really should check this out. Very powerful movie. I mean, it's in Korean, obviously. I mean, it's an English movie, but they all speak Korean, so you got to read the subtitles. An amazing guy. This man, um, he had a son who had uh, severe disabilities. And again, in that culture, they would just, typically, a lot of them would have aborted the child beforehand. And, and then they have these children, and because of laws in the country that involved them having to essentially register and stuff, before they even, they, they often have birth out in the street, someone just drop the kid, leave the kid there. So this man, to save those children's lives, he put this in, and now he, I think he has a whole bunch, and they've saved over 300 children since they've done this. Very powerful story. But what I really am trying to get at is this. Just like this pastor is given life to some children, Jesus has given us life. You know, we were orphan children in this world because of our sins. But because of the love of Christ, we are adopted into the family of God. This morning I want to take a look at Jesus' fifth I am statement from the Gospel of John. I am the resurrection and the life. And try to understand the significance behind this amazing statement mixed in with the awesome story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. But before we get into that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I praise you and I thank you. I ask that you uh, just guide me as I uh, attempt to proclaim your word accurately to the best of my ability. Lord, just bless me as I'm not feeling super well. Lord, just allow me to uh, present your word in a way that's going to make sense to all of us. And Father, like I do every week, I also ask that you Bless each and every one of us, including myself, and allow us to take something away from your word today. In your wonderful name, amen. amen. Turn to me to John chapter 11. We're going to do something a little bit different today. If you guys are familiar with the Calvary Chapel way of, um, of preaching, they do what they call expository, which I essentially consider myself an expository preacher, but they literally go verse by verse. They don't really break things down. I normally have points. This week, I just think this section of scripture is so powerful. What I decided to do is we're going to pretty much study right through it. And when we get to the I am statement, I'm going to make two quick points, because, you know, as a Baptist, I can't not make points. But we're just going to look at this powerful section of Scripture, and hopefully it won't take too long, because I usually have six to eight pages of notes, and now I have ten pages of notes. So we're going to do our best to, you know, get, get through this as fast as we can. So uh, 11, John, John chapter 11, starting at verse 1. Let's read the first three verses, and we'll kind of, I'll kind of talk about it here. Now, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany. The village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. So the events that occurred here in the first part of John chapter 11 take place right at the door of Jesus going into Jerusalem. We are right at that point. They're moments away, I mean really months away from him getting into Jerusalem. The exact time is really hard to tell. But we know that the beginning of John chapter 10 is actually the story that John hinted at in verse 2. Regarding Mary wiping, you know, putting ointment on Jesus' feet and wiping the tears off his feet with, his, uh, with, her, with her hair. We also know that the events I talked about last week, remember the really last two weeks where Jesus said, I am the gate and I am the good shepherd, took place right before Hanukkah, so December time of the year 32 AD. And we know that Jesus' death and resurrection was somewhere the end of March, early April, AD 33. So that time frame, if you can envision this, I would say it's probably a month beforehand. I mean, a month before he enters into Jerusalem, because we know, again, verse chapter 12 talks about how the events there where, where Mary is 
uh, essentially poured perfume on Jesus' feet took place six days before the Passover that is associated with the death of Christ. Bethany itself is located on the east side of the Mount of Olives. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom in to the map I just had. There you go. You see Jerusalem, and right there at the bottom is Bethany right next to Bethpage. And it's about two miles outside, as we're going to read in a few moments as well. Now, Lazarus was sick enough for these ladies, his sisters, to send word to the Lord. Notice that they did not request anything from Christ. They didn't send him this information and say, hey, come heal him. They just told him this information. So I just I thought that was interesting, an interesting um, little side note here. So let's keep on going. Look at verse 4 down to verse 6 now. But when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and, her La- and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, meaning Lazarus was sick, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. So I find it interesting that Jesus' disciples did not protest and say, hey, come on, let's go visit Lazarus. But I think the reasoning is because I don't think they had a full comprehension of what was taking place. They didn't completely understand that Lazarus was on his deathbed. And I really, if you look at verse 4, I think Jesus' statement probably gave them some peace and calm. So, for whatever reason, not that he was lying to them by any means, just what he said caused them not to understand this. He, they think he's going to get well. Obviously, Jesus doesn't think it's important enough for him to go quickly to Bethany. So, they decide to hang back, and the disciples don't complain. Now, the exact location that, uh, that Jesus was at the time he was informed, and again... He was informed by man. Being God, he already knew what was going to happen. So the exact place, we don't really know. Verse 6 tells us that Jesus waited two days. And we're going to find out that it was four days, that Jesus arrived four days after Lazarus died. So really, in reality, Jesus waited two days, and then was somewhere between a day or two in travel to get to Bethany. Many people believe that, if you kind of see on the map there, the Perea region, which is on the other side of the Jordan River, was probably where he was hanging out. Possibly, probably down south, right along that road that you see he would have to travel through Jericho in order to get to Bethany and Bethpage. But others believe that it was really out near Ephraim, which is out in the wilderness there. Either way, he was, I don't want to say in hiding, but he was not, he was really avoiding Jerusalem for, reasoning, for reasons that were quite clear that his life was at, at risk. And we're going to hear that in a moment as well. So verse 7 and verse 10. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus said, or Jesus answered, you are there, or are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. So after two days we're up, Jesus decides it's time to go visit Lazarus and Bethpage. Because again, Judea is where Bethpage is. That's really what he was saying. I mean, to me this kind of confused me because it almost sometimes feels like this section of scripture right in the midst of the story doesn't tie in. Why does he want to go to Judea? But again, Bethpage and Beth, Bethany and Jerusalem, that is Judea. That's the province of Judea. So what he's saying is I want to go visit Lazarus now. The disciples being under the impression that Lazarus is going to be okay... We're like, why are we going to risk our lives and go to, why are we going to go to Judea? Why are we going to risk our lives if Lazarus is fine? And of course, he's going to clarify this in a moment. Once again, I just think it's another example of how the disciples were not truly, didn't truly comprehend the situation. I mean, to me, it seems odd that they would attempt to restrain Jesus from returning to Judea in order to visit with Lazarus and his family. But like I said, I think the rationale was that, you know, Lazarus was fine. They weren't thinking this. And of course, like I said, in a moment, Jesus is going to fix this. I mean, if they did not fully grasp Lazarus' health situation, then trying to talk Jesus into staying for, away from the dangers and away to him in Judea would have made a lot more sense. If they understood Lazarus was dying, I don't think they would have thought twice about risking their lives to go visit him. Now, this is from the Bible Knowledge Commentary, just an interesting little um, piece of commentary I wanted to point out to you guys. Jesus spoke in a veiled way to illustrate that it would not be too dangerous to go to Bethany. In one sense, he was speaking of walking or living in physical light or darkness. In the spiritual realm, when one lives by the will of God, he is safe. 
Living in the realm of evil is dangerous. I mean, that makes sense. If you live in the realm of evil, you're risking your life, both physically and spiritually. As long as he followed God's plan, no harm would come till the appointed time. Applied to people then, they should have responded to Jesus while he was in the world as its light. Soon he would be gone, and some, and so would this unique opportunity. I mean, and really the point is, you know, if we walk in the light with Jesus... We're going to avoid sinfulness. We're going to avoid those temptations that come along with that. But if we're walking in the darkness away from Christ, we're prone to fall to those sins. Back to the, the, the text, verse 11 of John chapter 11, down to verse 16. This he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Therefore Thomas, who is called Didymus, which means twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us let us also go, so that we may die with him. So once again, I think it's quite clear that the disciples did not completely grasp the situation. They realized Lazarus was sick, but they didn't realize he was on his deathbed. In their mind, it didn't make any sense to go wake someone who was sick. If the man was sick and he's sleeping, he's recovering. Of course, the illustration Jesus is using is the one that I think benefits us as Christians. As Christians, when we die, we don't, our death isn't permanent. That's the belief we have. That's why the, the term fallen asleep is referred to so frequently by Paul in the New Testament. You know, as Christians, when we die, we're, it's only temporary. Our death is only temporary. And that's really what I'm going to be getting at in a few moments in, in when I get into the, the bulk of my sermon here. So then in verse 14, Jesus clearly tells them, as plain as he possibly could, Lazarus has died. He also hints, once again, at the amazing miracle that's going to come. I mean, he, he recognizes the, the significance of him waiting, which I'm going to emphasize to you guys in a moment as well. In verse 16, we read how Thomas says, let us also go so that we may die with him. I mean, he's saying that let us go and risk our lives along with Jesus. He was willing to do this. Now, remember, this is the same Thomas that following his disciples informing him that Jesus was resurrected, said this in John chapter 20, verse 21. Unless I see his hands... Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put, <coughs> and put my finger in the place of the nails and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. <coughs> the same Thomas we call doubting had an immense amount of faith at this point. At this point, Thomas shows great leadership in calling the rest of the group to go with him and visit Judea and go visit Lazarus. Of course, we do, not, we do know that in the coming months, of course, in their time, really the coming month, when Jesus is arrested, all the disciples, including Thomas, abandoned him. So the doubts come back fast. So let's look now at verse 17. This is actually a pic picture of Bethany, you know, the city. Verse 17 of John chapter 11. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. And that's Lazarus, of course. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. I said that before. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Jesus finally arrived at Bethany, he found out that Lazarus had been dead in the tomb for four days. As a result of the climate in the Middle East, it was important for them to bury the dead fast. If they didn't bury Lazarus immediately, the heat and stuff would have caused decay to take place very fast, and it was not a pleasant thing. They put him immediately in the tomb. So he had been in the tomb four days. And again, understanding that Jesus waited, it more than likely Lazarus' death took place around the time that the, um, the two men arrived there to meet with Jesus. So Mary and Martha are going to have already known, and this is going to come into play in a minute, that Jesus had, they're pretty much, there was nothing he can do. I mean, Lazarus was already dead. Of course, that's what they think. Now, now verse 19 gives us a little bit of a like kind of a background, or kind of a, a look into how Jewish people um, deal with grief, really. And it gives us a look into the Jewish culture when it comes to death. When a person died, the Jews mourned for a prolonged period of time. During this period, it was considered a pious duty to comfort the bereaved. That's why these individuals from Jerusalem were there to comfort Mary as well as Martha. The passing four days since Jesus' death, in, okay, Jesus' death, Lazarus' death, 
and Jesus waiting as long as he did is quite an amazing thing when we understand the um, Jewish understanding of death, or if you want to call it that, however you want to word it. And this is from the New American Commentary. The general belief was that the spirit of the deceased hovered around the body for three days in anticipation of some possible means of re-entry into the body. But on the third day it was believed that the body lost its color and the spirit was locked out. Therefore, the spirit was obliged to enter the chambers of Sheol, meaning the place of the dead. The passing of the third day, therefore, signaled the conclusion of the last monicum, monicum of hope for the mourners. And, of course, Jesus waited four days. But you kind of understand the significance here. And, and again, the idea that Jesus waited just the right amount of time to make this, the idea that Lazarus could have ever been resurrected, impossible. And to me, I just, I, I think it's awesome. I mean, and we're going to, and it's going to make more sense, of course, as we keep on going here. Now look at verse 22, down to verse 20, uh, 20, uh, 20 down to verse 22. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. But Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So Martha's faith is just, it's such a powerful thing. We're going to see this in the coming verses. I, to me, it's just unbelievable. Her comments and her actions just show us the immense amount of faith that she obviously had. She knew that Jesus could have healed her brother beforehand, and she also hinted that he can really do whatever he wants now. He's in control. Martha was not upset with Jesus, nor did she throw any criticism towards him for not getting to Lazarus in time. This was the case because she knew that her brother had died before the messengers had arrived, and that's kind of what I'm getting at. I mean, Martha knew the time they left and knew how long it would take them to get to Jesus. Lazarus died in that time, so she, in her mind, there's nothing she can accuse him of because he didn't know. Which, of course, again, he's God. So it kind of shows you her lack of understanding to some level. Look at 23 and 24 now. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So Jesus tells her that, yeah, in the end he's going to rise again. Of course, that's how Martha interpreted it. And Jesus is like, hey, little do you know kind of thing. But... And, and she acknowledges, yeah, I mean, that's what they believe. Just kind of like the, how we Christians believe is, well, we're going to resurrect on the last day, which is what I'm going to get at in the next couple of verses. So let's look at verse 25 and 26. This is the I am statement that we're really supposed to be focusing on. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And of course... Martha is going to answer that question when we come back to the scripture text. If we believe that Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of our sins, and, and kind of from last week that means to redeem us, and if we believe that he rose from the grave so that we can go to heaven when he died, meaning reconciled us with God, we will not face death, but only in eternity in heaven. The Greek word used here for resurrection comes from the word anatos, anastasis, anastasis, it means a rising up, a rising as in rising up from a chair is the literal sense, or a rising from the dead. The Greek word used here for life comes from the word zoe, and means life, the state of one who is possessed of vitality or animate of a living soul. What Jesus, what I really interpret this as him really saying was that he is the provider of the resurrection and the life. Is what he's saying. And here's my quick little um, thesis statement, if you want to call it that, of what we're going to get. He can't really see that very well. But that says, that's a cross with the words in red of these two verses. I believe as Christians, we are going to go through two different resurrections. And that's kind of me just saying, really, it's all one resurrection. But two resurrections, a spiritual resurrection and a physical resurrection. When we die physically on this earth, our soul is going to split with our body. And it's going to leave that body and our body is going to stay here and we're going to be resurrected into heaven spiritually. We will depart from the shell that, is the, that has housed us and walk in the streets of golden heaven. The soul of our loved ones, meaning our friends and family who knew Christ, are now in heaven. Their bodies are still on earth, at least temporarily, and in the grave where they're going to stay until the physical resurrection, which is the next resurrection, is going to take place. Keep your finger here. Turn to me to Ephesians chapter 2. So keep your finger in John. We're going to come back there. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 all the way down to verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. 
the Apostle Paul writes for the church in Ephesus. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God." not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God permitted beforehand, so that we would walk in them. We will be physically resurrected, spiritually resurrected to heaven because of our faith in Christ. Now turn to me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We read earlier first, uh, verse 1 down to verse 11, and then verse uh, 20, I believe, or somewhere in there we kept on reading. And now we're going to read kind of right in the middle of it. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 12. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth. Now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. Of course, he's talking um, hypothetically. Verse 15. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God, because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are all off, we are all, okay, we are of all men most to be pitied. I mean, he's saying that it, there has to be a resurrection. That's really what he's getting at. How can we say that there's not? What hope do we have? What reason do we have to follow Christ if there's not a resurrection? So there's the spiritual resurrection, then there's the physical resurrection. Your body will reconnect with your soul. And I'm going to go, try to go over this quickly. Um, the first, there's several elements of this. First of all, I believe that when, at the end of times, the Lord's going to come and He's with a loud cry, going to return in the sky. We call this the rapture. Our physical bodies, the dead in Christ, are going to rise first, meaning the souls that are with Him in heaven are going to reconnect with the bodies here on earth and are going to ascend to heaven with Him. Following that, those of us who are still alive are going to ascend to heaven, body and all. Meaning the body you are currently in is the body that you're going to be in in heaven. Which is an interesting side note. That's from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 down to verse 17. So the first physical resurrection I want to point out is the resurrection of Jesus' followers, meaning Christians. After the rapture, there's going to be seven years of horrible tribulation faced on this earth. During that time, some are going to come to know the Lord, praise God. Some people are going to come and embrace Jesus and accept Him as their Lord and Savior. Those individuals are going to be called tribulation saints. Turn to me to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. I'm going to read verse 4 down to verse 6. And it's going to hit on both the tribulation saints as well as what the future resurrection will be for those who do not know Christ. Revelation chapter 20 verse 4. John, the disciple and the apostle, the man who was at the foot of the cross, who um, took Mary with him as, uh, as his mother. And her as um, or him as his her son, he writes this in what he saw. He said, "Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and he had not and, and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand." And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So that is the, 
this physical resurrection of those who had died during the tribulation that were Christians. But then the verse continues and it kind of points towards those who do not know Christ. Because there's going to be a physical resurrection for everybody. Even those who had not embraced Jesus, who do not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, will one day be resurrected. Unfortunately, they're not going to the same location we are. Uh, verse 5 continues, The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. So this means after the thousand year reign. We have the rapture before the seven year tribulation. After the seven year tribulation, Jesus returns and physically plants himself on the Mount of Olives. At that point, the tribulation saints are resurrected. A thousand years later, the millennial kingdom, Satan's released again. And now we get, once again, everyone else is resurrected. And that's what this is referring to. In verse, well, we'll, we'll skip verse 6. So this is the, this is the resurrection of the non-Christians. And then finally, one last group of people, pretty much the rest of them, are the Old Testament saints. People who, in the Old Testament, were considered faithful. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19 says, Your dead will live, their corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy. For your dew is as the dew of the dawn. And the earth will give birth to departed spirits. And then Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 to end of verse 3. And I love the book of Daniel. It's a very powerful book. Daniel writes, Now at that time Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. In the expanse of heaven. And those who lead many to righteousness. Like the stars forever and ever. So at some point during that end time. I'm not entirely sure when. I'm thinking it very well could be before the tribulation. Meaning along with the rapture. It could be after. It could be after the millennial. Those who are considered faithful of the Old Testament saints. Are also going to resurrect. So let's get to the end of this here. Back, back to John chapter 11. And we're going to go right to the end. So that, that's kind of the the... The, the point of my, uh, the, the, the I am the resurrection and the life, that we are going to be resurrected, every one of us. The question is to where. But now let's take a look at Lazarus. Verse 27. So Jesus asked her, do you believe? And it says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And once again, Martha makes what I would say is just an amazing statement of faith. She said to him, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even who has come into the world. I mean, she calls him the Messiah. I mean, the long-awaited Messiah. She calls him the Son of God. But then what I really think is amazing, and the part that we might kind of neglect, is the fact that she emphasizes that he is not of this world. She recognized that he did not come from this world. He's from heaven. I mean, just an amazing statement. And really what came to my mind when I when I read this is how many of us are able to say that? I mean, and obviously I hope all of us that are here are able to say this. But we have people throughout this town, throughout this world that I don't think would be able to say that. And it's my calling as a minister to do my best to lead them to their ability to call Jesus their Messiah. To call him the Son of God who is not of this world, that has come into this world. Look at verse 28 down to verse 31 now. When she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she, meaning Mary, heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. In verse 30, Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. Then the, then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. So it would seem that Martha, uh, when she initially got up, got up and Mary was left behind. I'm not sure if, did Martha tell Mary, hey, Jesus is here, let's go. And Mary decided not to. The way that Mary reacted when she finally left tells me that maybe Mary didn't know. Now Martha comes down. Martha tells Mary, hey, Jesus is here. Mary gets up. She's running off to, to meet the teacher. And, and uh, as he's approaching the city again, he's not entered the city yet. The intense grief that goes along with, this, with the loss of a loved one is clearly on display, according to John. I think we really read this in the, in the text. 
In verse 31, John records that Mary, along with Mary, was, was this group of grieving Jewish people that were there consoling her. They came along with her. One might say, why is John telling us this? But I think it's clear that what he's trying to do, he's building up the anticipation of what Jesus is about to do. This was not a miracle that was witnessed only by a few. This was a miracle witnessed by a large group of people. And, and as a result, many came to know him as their Lord. And we read in verse 19 that many of the Jews came to Mary and Martha. And now in verse 31 that many of them are also accompanying Mary as she eventually makes her way with Jesus to the tomb. Verse 32. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Once again, with a similar faith to Martha, she just, just puts her faith on display in understanding that Jesus could have healed it. But of course, there's still something Jesus could do. Verse 33 down to verse 37 now. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Then verse 35, Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man also from dying? So once again, we got to note the scene. we got Mary who is in a total state of grief, followed by this other group, along with Martha, her sister, which I'm sure was there as well. They are all making their way to this tomb. You just, I think the grief is something I really want to emphasize, the, the funeral-like atmosphere, the, the mourning that was taking place. And I think it's clear that Jesus noticed this grief, and it affected him. In verse 33, it tells us that, we, that he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Unlike the gods of the Romans and the Greeks and all the other different religions of those times, the nations of those times, uh, biblical times, Jesus showed great emotion towards mankind. He was affected by their grief of these people. Now, this is something I found very interesting. I just think the way we understand deeply moved in spirit and troubled, you might think, oh, he was grieved. That's not what this word means. The Greek word used here for deeply moved is embry ma omai, embry ma omai. And if we translated it literally, it could mean groaned, but more likely it meant angered. Jesus got angry at the situation. So that's kind of an interesting thought. And I'll get to that in a minute. He was also troubled. The Greek word used here for troubled comes from the word tarasso. and means to agitate. So Jesus was angered and agitated by the situation. So we need to kind of, kind of gain an understanding of what that means. So really the question is this. Why? Why was Jesus angry and agitated at the situation? And this, I believe what this was from the Bible Knowledge Commentary. They said some have argued that he was angry because of the people's unbelief or hypocritical wailing. Like the fact that they don't believe that he is who he says he is, obviously. I mean, this is the Messiah standing here. Don't you think he can still do something? But that's not the point. I don't think that's what the right answer is. But this seems foreign to the context. A better explanation is that Jesus was angry at the tyranny of Satan who had brought sorrow and death to the people of, um, through sin. And I think that's probably what it was. He was angry at the situation, not because of the people, but because of the, the devil who was influencing them. Verse 34, Jesus asks to be shown where Lazarus is entombed. And then verse 35 is the shortest verse in many of our English translations. But I want to point something out just because I feel it necessary. In Greek, it's actually not the shortest verse in the New Testament. So some people think it is. In our English translation, it is to often consider the shortest verse. Luke chapter 20, verse 30 in Greek is actually shorter than verse 35. The Greek phrase used here in verse 35 is edak rusen ha yeshua. Or yeshus. And essentially wept Jesus. So if you see the amount of the Greek word is much longer than the English word. But unlike the loud wailing of the mourners were Mary and Mar with Mary and Martha, Jesus' weeping was more of a soft crying. It wasn't the, the, the extreme grief of yelling out loud. This was Jesus weeping, again, from within, possibly weeping over the, the tragic consequences of sin. Because, again, sin is what causes physical death. Adam and Eve's sin in the garden is why we have to die physically. If Adam and Eve never sinned in the garden, we'd still be in the garden of Gethsemane right now. And in reality, of course, God had a plan so we don't want to go too far into this kind of uh, getting into the deep stuff. Let's look at now at verse 38 down to verse 40. Verse 38. So Jesus, again being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, 
and a stone was lying against it. And of course, this is the tomb in Bethany that they attribute to Lazarus. Whether it actually is or not, I don't think it's possible to know. So that's just an interesting little um, side thought there. And then in verse 39, Jesus said, Remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. In verse 40, Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So still deeply moved, Jesus stood before this cave. I mean, it's clear that he's been deeply moved. He, he stood before this cave that, that served as Lazarus' burial spot and asked for the stone to be removed. And I think it's also kind of important to look at the similarities between Jesus' tomb as well as this, as well the situation. Martha objected to this being done. She didn't want the tomb open because by now Lazarus' body would have begun to decay. This is, I mean, again, this is at the end of it. Like three days are over, like I said, the Jewish beliefs of, um, of the dead and stuff. This is most definitely... After that fact, this is now when he's, he's dead, he's done, he's over. So the idea of taking the stone away was not a very good idea. He stinketh is uh, something one of the comedians I remember listening to a while back. Just he, he's, he's, he's done, he's decaying, he's, he's dead. And for, him, for Jesus to have the tomb opened didn't make any sense. Another important thing to remember is this. Jewish law would have made the individual who interacted with that dead body unclean. Martha's thinking in her head, well, Jesus, if you interact with, with Lazarus, who's dead, you're going to become unclean. You're the rabbi, you're the teacher, you can't do that. Nonetheless, obedience to Christ is more important than the law. And of course, that's what he's essentially telling her. He's reminding her of the promise he's already made. You know, trust me. Verse 41 and verse 42 now. So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes. And said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear, hear me. Because, but because of the people standing around, I said it. So that they may believe that you sent me. So the tension surrounding the situation must be great. A large crowd. Jesus standing before the open tomb. The grief that was, has been surrounded the group that's been embracing the group. Is now being intermixed with what I would call confusion. What is he doing? What does he want us to do as he's standing there in front of this open tomb? The odor must have been present. They must have started smelling Lazarus. So what, do, what does Jesus do? He prays. I mean, isn't that just an awesome thought? Imagine if every time we were in the midst of a, a grief-stricken moment, a confusion moment, that we turned to the Lord and we prayed. And that's what Jesus did. He prayed. He thanked God for the opportunity to show the old present, the glory of God. He's going to put God on display. Now, verse 34. Or verse, uh, yeah, 43, sorry. Verse 43. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Jesus did not simply make a quiet request. He didn't say, hey, Lazarus, come on out. He commanded Lazarus to end, exit this grave, to rise from the dead and exit this grave. Meaning he shouted, in describing Jesus' command to Lazarus, John uses three Greek words. He essentially uses this phrase, Fana Megala Ekurgasen. With a great with a loud okay, let me try this again. With a voice great he cried out. So it's kind of a different um, wording, a different uh, word order as uh, our English. Fona, which is, means essentially sound or tone meaning voice. So we think of phone. Phona is just the idea of the voice, the vo vocal noises that we make out of our mouths. Megala comes from the Greek verb magas, which means great or large, is where we get our English word mega from. So Jesus' voice was great. And then on top of it, we have this verb, ekargasen. It's in, in the aorist tense, which is past tense. And it comes from the word karagazo, karagazo, which means to cry out, to cry aloud, to shout, to cry out to one. The point I'm really getting at here is not only did he cry out, not only did he shout with a loud voice, he did them together. He cried out with a loud voice. I mean, I, just the emphasis needs to be pointed out. This isn't just Jesus yelling. This was, you know, he cried to Lazarus with a loud voice. In the solitude of this grief-stricken situation, in the midst of what I would call a funeral, Jesus' voice would have been heard by everyone around him. I mean, I always thought, imagine being that guy walking down the street that kind of missed the beginning of all this. And his hearing, you know, as Jesus stands before this open tomb, as someone, he's crying out to the dead to come on out, you know. 
I mean, it just must have been an amazing situation. Augustine, the great Christian theologian from earlier times, from much closer to Jesus' time, once remarked that if Jesus had not used Lazarus' name, that all who were dead in that area would have risen from the grave. So he had to use Lazarus' name, or whether that's true or not, obviously we don't know. If the craziness of the moment wasn't enough, it wasn't already amplified to the max it was now, Jesus had just called the dead man to exit the tomb. I mean, he, there's got to be people there that initially, at this moment, must have thought, well, okay, I'm going to walk away. This guy's obviously crazy. But obviously, moments later, that wasn't what happened. Verse 44. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Lazarus ro rose from death to life. Because of the words of the Son of God. Because of the Messiah. Now notice that John once again characterized Lazarus' past state. Like I just think this is important. Once again John's saying that he was dead. You know I would go. The man who had been dead. The man that who had died came forth. He wasn't alive in that tomb. He was very dead in that tomb. And like I said emphasizing going back to the three days. With the, the spirit of the, the, the soul of the individual hovering over uh, the dead person. It was very significant that Jesus waited four days. It was extremely significant that Jesus did this. It just it would have been hard, impossible for them to comprehend that Jesus could have risen him from the grave. It wouldn't have ever made any sense, yet he did it. I mean, because he is God. Now, it's also important to recognize that Lazarus was completely bound head to foot. I mean, and uh, oh, yeah, I should click forward. And I don't even think this picture is the best description. I don't think he would have been able to move his feet. He would have been mum like a mummy that was like a penguin wiggling out of this thing. He was completely tied up. He was wrapped up tightly in order to, again, to preserve the body to the best of their ability. He was wrapped up so he would have exited. And the proof of this is the fact that Jesus had to ask other people to untie him. He was tied up. I mean, Jesus had already asked the dead man to rise from the grave. He could have said, hey, untie yourself. But it wasn't possible for Lazarus to physically do. Now, of course, this is not the only time that Jesus rose to, raised someone from the dead. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we read that Jesus raised Jairus' daughter, or Jairus' daughter. And in Luke, we read that Jesus raised the widow's son. The difference between these two resurrections is the fact that Lazarus had been dead for four days, where the other two have not. The funeral is over for Lazarus. He was engraved. Where for these other two individuals, the widow's son who was being carried out of the city, essentially approaching the tomb within a day of his death, and um, Jairus' daughter who had just died, these two individuals had just died from the dead. It was, the significance, the, the amazingness of this, of this miracle wasn't as extreme. Or this miracle was just so much more awesome is how I would say. I, I don't even know. Unbelievable type thing. So let me close up now here. We know very little about Lazarus. In fact, something that I find amazing is that there's not a single recorded word of the man in the Bible. But the one thing that is clear is that Lazarus listened to the Lord. He listened to Jesus. The beginning of John chapter 12 tells us that Lazarus and his sisters were reclining around a table with Jesus. I'm assuming listening to him preach, listening to him talk as they're eating dinner. And of course, Lazarus listened to Jesus. He obeyed Jesus when he came out of the grave. Jesus called for him to come forth and Lazarus came forth. Lazarus' resurrection poses this important question. When you die, do you fully expect that your con next conscious experience will be hearing the voice of Jesus call you by name? Meaning when you die, that is the next step going to be being in heaven? Being embraced by Jesus. Upon departing from this world and entering into the next, will you hear the voice of the Lord and Savior, your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, calling out to you? Or are you going to hear the voice of someone else? Someone who will do nothing but harm you for the rest of eternity. Philippians chapter 2 verse 8 down to verse 11. Paul writes this. Being found in appearance as a man. He, meaning Jesus, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on the cross. Or a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him. And bestowed him. And bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow. Of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The bottom line is every one of us are going to answer for what we've done on this earth. 
for those of us who have a relationship with Jesus, we're going to be able to turn to Him. So the next conscious moment in our minds upon our death will be being embraced by our Lord and Savior in heaven. All of us are going to see the afterlife. What side of it are you going to see? Are you going to see eternal life in Christ Jesus in the arms of Jesus? Or eternal damnation in the grips of Satan? And it's to the point, but it's true. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says, Behold, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and he will dine with, or, and will dine with him and he with me. Turn to Christ today. And the answer, to, and our answer to him would be, yes, Lord. You know, he calls us forth from the grave. You know, upon entering heaven, we're going to be able to be embraced by him. And again, the other option is not, not even worth considering. Turn to Jesus today and know that he loves you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I praise you and I thank you now as we close. I ask that you just put a special touch on us as we uh, leave here today. Allow us to remember the story of Lazarus. This amazing story, I'd say, uh, of all the miracles that Jesus performed, this is the greatest, the most powerful and meaningful miracle. Lord, I just ask now that you help us know that if we're able to call Jesus the resurrection and the life, we can go to heaven. He is the great I am. He is the redeemer of all the earth. He's the one who reconciles us to God. So, Lord, I praise you and I thank you, Father. I ask that you guide us as we come to you. Allow us to turn to you and allow us to know that you're a loving God who wants us to love you and to know you and to be with you in heaven, Lord. Don't let us go the other direction. Life is too difficult, Lord. There's so many temptations that draw us away from you. Help us stay focused on you. Help us know that you love us. We praise you and we thank you in your wonderful name. Amen.